there are some amazing D&D 5e character classes that almost nobody talks about. That's right. The top tier work of even the most notable third party 5th edition publishers is never even given a chance by most players. Wanting to give these awesome character options a bit of well-deserved attention, I asked you. What is your favorite unofficial player character class for 5e? We ended up with a ton of responses and I spent a while sorting through all the comments to create this totally official and definitive ranking of the most highly praised 5th edition character classes not published by Wizard of the Coast. So in this video, I'm going to quickly share the entire list and with your help, hopefully challenge a few of our favorite D&D character builder analysis creators to make their own videos about some of the classes. Then we'll take a look at one really cool class sponsoring this video, and finally, the top two favorite third-party 5e classes among this community. Because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together, and here it is. To keep the list simple for the purposes of this video, they're sorted by the number of comments in which they were mentioned, then just alphabetically for all the ties. For example, the bottom of the list technically consists of 42 classes or publishers that were each mentioned one time in the comments. As they're scrolling by on your screen, I won't read every single one, but I gotta shout out a couple, like Indestructo Boy, who got a comment here praising pretty much everything he makes, and specifically his Vanguard class. Shout out to the guy who said Pathfinder, because as we all know, every single post or video about D&D Homebrew needs at least one comment saying just to play Pathfinder. And Valda's Spire of Secrets, which is a huge book of 5e character options that had a bunch of classes mentioned here as well as higher in the comments where we got our first mentions of the classes in a similarly huge 5e supplement, The Ultimate Adventurer's Handbook, which is some nice reinforcement because I mentioned them both in the big review video that came out a couple weeks ago. Plus several classes and general praise for Laser Llama and Kibbles Tasty, who seem like incredibly productive and successful designers that have somehow flown under my radar, then big props for the Gunslinger by Heavy Arms, which was the highest rated Gunslinger class among the five mentioned in these comments. And near the top, we have, of course, Matt Mercer's Blood Hunter, which I'm surprised wasn't rated at the very top simply because of how popular Matt Mercer is. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Matt Mercer. Yeah! <laughs> oh boy! That's a lot, That's a That's a lot of people. <laughs> but like the comments said, maybe because we all forget that it isn't an official class, lol. Or maybe because I've heard other folks say that it's really kind of too powerful even for 5th edition. Is that a hot take? I don't think it's a hot take. Bloodhunter is pretty powerful, but it's also the only published third party class that one of my players has actually used at my table. Because typically, if we're going outside the rulebook, we'll just make it up ourselves which is an epic segue because the Bloodhunter class actually tied with a number of comments from people just talking about their own homebrew creations. And that was pretty great to see on this post. I think it's critical for us to remember that every single rule in the official books started out as somebody's homebrew when they were just playing a game with their friends and said, hey, I think it would be cool if we, and they tried it, they liked it, and one way or another, it got the attention of the people who write the books. So on that note, I have two requests. One, tell me down in the comments if you've ever homebrewed a class for 5e or other RPG systems, because my friends and I all did that for our first campaign, and it was wild. I could probably make a whole video about it. Anyway, request number two, leave a comment tagging your favorite D&D rules crunching YouTube creator who you would like to see dive into some third party classes with actual calculations and the interactions with other 5e feats and spells and all the stuff people love to watch and then complain about on Reddit. Because we're about to check out the top most popular 5th edition character classes from this list, but since this is my channel, we're just going to focus on the unique elements of these character options and what makes them fun. If that sounds good, or if you're liking this video, or just appreciate and want to see more awesome work from third-party publishers, give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend so I know to make more stuff like this and YouTube knows that people actually care about something besides the official books. This is also a great time to mention that none of the classes or publishers on our list are sponsoring this video, but right now we're gonna take a break from the list to talk about this video's sponsor, the Psionic class for 5th edition by Night Vision Creative. 
Their first Kickstarter 5e class, The Summoner, earned over 20 times its funding goal, meaning they got to put even more into this one. So before we even get into the Psionic class details, know that the book itself includes the class, two subclasses, 26 feats including chained feats to create what they call paragon paths that are open to all 5e classes, plus six new magic items, eight new spells, a new race, a new background, a few psionic creatures to use in your game, lore about psionics, and lots of great artwork. Now, subject to change because they'll be doing another full round of playtesting with the Kickstarter backers, let's check out the first few levels of the alpha playtest 5e psionic. They get a d10 hit die like the fighter, paladin, and ranger with the same equipment proficiencies as the ranger, light and medium armor, shields, all weapons, no tools, but they have a very unique pair of saving throw proficiencies, intelligence, and constitution. Then, the psionic starting equipment, according to this alpha doc, is the same as the barbarian, offering axes and javelins and the explorer's pack. And these flavors just keep coming because at first level, not second, not third, but first level, the psionic chooses their discipline, aka subclass, which makes them a little like the 5e cleric. But also at first level, they get their main feature, psi which feels a bit like a monk's key points, but focuses on mind over spirit. You have tapped into powerful mental energies you can apply to tasks which are represented by psi points. These points allow you to direct your mind to create a variety of powerful effects. Some of these effects trigger saving throws with the DC based on your intelligence. You get one point per level and regain these points on a short or long rest. Without spoiling all three Psy abilities, I'll tell you that one of the effects is called Psy Move, and it seems very much like a Jedi Force Push, but you can also use it to pull a target toward you. And what's even cooler about these Psy abilities is that unlike the 5e monk's key points, you don't have to spend the points just to use the ability. You can always use it, and if you want to, you can spend points to boost the effect. Finally, at level one, the psionic also receives unarmored defense, but rather than being based on con like a barbarian or wisdom like a monk, it's based on, you guessed it, your intelligence. At level two, they choose a fighting style with a couple new ones in the list, and the psionic chooses two amplifications from a big table of like 30 options that are somewhat analogous to warlock eldritch invocations, boosting existing features or providing new capabilities. Then at level three, they choose a Psy Focus, which enhances one of your three Psy abilities, like that Jedi Force Push, for example. At level four, they get an ability score improvement. At five, they get an extra attack. And if you want to know more, check out the 5e Psionic Kickstarter through the link below and join their playtest. So next time we do a video like this, the Psionic will be one of the most popular on the list. And here we go. The runner up to the most popular third party 5e class is The Beast Heart by MCDM. Not to judge a book by its cover, but if we did, The Beast Heart would be number one. Stunning fantasy artwork and made to look like a lightly worn magazine. I love it. Looking inside, I like how the credits page lists a ton of playtesters, so you know they actually playtested it. And more than just the Beast Heart class, the first half of this document contains rules for the companion creatures that fight an adventure right alongside your Beast Heart player character. The general rules for companions and how the creature interacts with its respective player character, aka their caregiver, are very clean. But as someone who's leaning more and more rules light in my playstyle, they lost me a little bit with ferocity. It's not exactly complicated, but it's like a subsystem of mechanics for tracking both the accumulation and the expenditure of ferocity points during every round of every combat. As far as I can tell, this is the crunchiest part of the class as well, but I can already see the D&D Shorts video, instant maximum ferocity for Beast Heart Companions, because you know he's gonna figure out some wild way to manipulate a feature like this. <laughs> and I'm not calling him out or anything. He's great. We actually talked about this video beforehand. Now, onto the actual Beast Heart class. They get a D8 hit die like the Bard, Cleric, Druid, Monk, Rogue, and Warlock. They are proficient with light armor, medium armor, shields, simple weapons, and a handful of specific martial weapons and zero tools. The Beast Heart's saving throws are Strength and Wisdom, which is another unique combo compared to the official 5e classes. They choose three skills, and their equipment really sets them up with the aesthetic of either a ranger, a barbarian, or something in between, and that feels perfect for this class. Starting at level one, the Beast Heart has, you guessed it, a companion creature with a supernatural connection. So unlike standard companion creatures, which can die by the same rules as most player characters, the Beast Heart's companion creature is 
straight up immortal. You can meditate for one minute so the companion regains all their HP, and even if the companion's body was destroyed, they reform within five feet of you. Also at level one, the beast heart can verbally communicate simple ideas with their companion as well as all beasts and monstrosities. This is cool, but it means that as written, you could have a dragon wormling companion and not be able to communicate with other dragon wormlings. And this applies to a handful of other sample companions in here that are not beasts or monstrosities. Then at level two, the beast heart learns three primal exploits to enhance their companion's abilities or add new ones. They remind me very much of the fighter battlemaster maneuvers because they have the same pros, but thankfully they avoid the major con of most battlemaster maneuvers. Because where I feel like every martial character or at least every fighter should just be able to attempt to trip enemies or disarm them or do most of the things that you apparently need those maneuvers to even attempt, most of these primal exploits that I read seemed much more like special, unique maneuvers that must be learned and trained in order to attempt them, which is a strong improvement. Also at second level, a Beast Heart's companion gets a boost to their save DC. Then at third level, you choose one of the five subclasses in this dock and gain proficiency in animal handling or double proficiency in that skill if you are already proficient in it. And at this point, you've probably become a Pokemon master, but I kid you not, this class table is packed with features at each level all the way up to 20, where you gain the feature Unbreakable Friendship, and I love that. And now, we are finally ready to reveal the number one most popular independently published player character class compatible with the fifth edition of the world's oldest fantasy role-playing game, The Pugilist by Benjamin Huffman. Quick aside, this feels really cool, because way back in the day when I started this channel, I was doing a bunch of reviews of DMs Guild products, and while I never made a video specifically about this class, because it actually came out in 2016, several years before the start of my channel, I did review a couple of Benjamin's books over the years, and it's just neat to see his work resurfacing on this channel, because it was essentially demanded by the community. That's ultimately what I'd like to see more of, third-party work being so embraced by the 5e community that creators like me have no choice but to talk about it at some point, like how it feels with official D&D content. To begin, the lore of this unarmed fighter is great. Pugilists unconsciously tap into their own inner strength in the form of moxie. This is not an esoteric or mystical energy that flows through the multiverse, but the result of determination forged over a lifetime of hardship with a never-say-die attitude. There are a couple supplemental D6 tables to help flesh out your pugilist backstory with hardships you've faced, a favorite hangout spot, and a rumor about your own reputation. The pugilist gets a D8 hit die, proficiency in light armor, simple and improvised weapons, the hand crossbow, and the player's choice of artisan's tools, a gaming set, or thieves' tools. They're proficient in strength and con saves like the barbarian, and their equipment is pretty light. Leather armor or a simple weapon, a pack, and a tool set. Then starting at first level, the pugilist gets their fisticuffs die, similar to the 5e monk die, except it's one die higher at every level. And as far as I remember Jeremy Crawford saying at the WotC Creator Summit, the monk's die is also being raised by one at every level for one D&D. So Ben literally set the bar for this change seven years ago. Well done. Fisticuffs also allows you to make a grapple or an additional unarmed strike as a bonus action when you attack on your turn. And at first level, you get a unique version of unarmored defense called Iron Chin, where you can be wearing light or no armor and not wielding a shield, and your AC equals 12 plus your con modifier. This is really interesting because it means you really get to max out strength and con without needing to worry about dexterity for boosting your AC, and this means that the pugilist doesn't step on the monk's toes because the monk is pretty definitively a dex-based unarmed fighter, while the pugilist is strength-based. And this is important to recognize because the first level two feature, Moxie, does seem a lot like the monk's key points and or the psionics psi points that we talked about earlier. You get three additional abilities to use them with. You do need to spend the points to use these abilities, but you regain the points on a short or long rest. And also right here at level two, you get street smart. And now carousing, shadow boxing, or sparring all count as light activity for the purposes of resting for you so it's easier to regain those points. Then at level three, you choose a subclass called a fight club from 11 different options in this book. At least that's how many are in the Ultimate Adventurer's Handbook version. And in addition to the subclass at level three, you get 
bloodied but unbowed, so when you're at less than half HP, you can use your reaction to gain some temp HP and regain some moxie points. And as we've heard before, at 4th level, you get an ASI, at 5th level, you get an extra attack, but wait, what's this? At 4th level, you also get a new bonus action to gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for 1 minute, and at 5th level, you get the Haymaker. Like a modified Great Weapon Master attack, you can take disadvantage on an attack roll, but if you hit, you deal max damage instead of rolling. Then, like the Beast Heart, you're getting something at every level, all the way to level 20, but if you want to know more, you owe the publisher to check it out yourself, or demand more third-party coverage from your favorite RPG YouTube creators. So thank you for supporting this type of comment. Remember that likes, shares, and comments go a long way, but if you want to support this channel directly, you can join the wonderful Bob World Builder patrons and get some cool rewards. Thank you for your support, and keep building.